G'day guys, welcome back to Max Super. Uh, I'm going to be telling you about my 5-axis machine again, who would have thought? But uh, I'm going to be telling you this time about how I would improve it, because there was a lot of questions about that on the previous, the one successful video that I have. I'm going to be talking about a few things about how I would improve it if I was going to make it again. So the things that I'll be looking at are the gantry shape, the gantry orientation, the style of the gantry, the uh, linear motion guides that I used and sort of how I set those up, and also the motion controller that I was using to control all of it. And while I tell all of you this, just keep in mind that I'm not an engineer. I've just built a machine and I've been building things all my life, so it's, it's kind of like an intuitive eye for engineering. So first up is the gantry shape. Although it was pretty beefy, it wasn't, it wasn't beefy enough and the shape of it was not quite right. So um, the best shape to absorb a torsional force, which is the kind of force that the gantry is experiencing, because as you imagine, if you imagine like if this is a gantry and you've got the tool extended all the way down, uh, the tool gets forces and it's twisting that gantry. And uh, a good shape for a gantry would be a round bar, but that's not practical to actually build a gantry out of. So the closest thing to that is a square that's practical. And if the z-axis was not as tall, this gantry probably would have been perfectly, um, perfectly performant. But the problem was that it was a really long z-axis and uh, when the z-axis was extended all the way down, you would start to see signs of this gantry just flexing a little bit too much and it would build up a resonance. So to fix that, yeah, you'd make that gantry just as tall but also much thicker so it's closer to a square shape but now that kind of looks lopsided so knowing what i know now i would just redesign the whole thing to look something like this better bearing spacing better support and honestly not much more difficult to make another option to make the gantry more rigid if you can't make it thicker is that you can put internal gussets at regular intervals along the inside of the, you know, the, the gantry sh structure. And uh, that's boxing it off at intervals and that'll reduce, that will increase the rigidity of the entire structure. So gantry style. This is, um, this is kind of an interesting one. I like to think about this one. So I don't really know the names, the correct names, if there are any correct names for these styles of gantry. So I call them the moving gantry bridge, the moving gantry beam, which is my type of machine, and the moving table. So of course, there's pros and cons to each type. So the pros for a beam type of machine, like mine, a moving beam, is that it, the machine doesn't have to account for the weight of the part that you put in there, because the gantry is always the same thing. It's always the same structure with the same tools. It doesn't have to move the workpiece around. Being a moving gantry style of machine, you can have a pretty large work envelope for a relatively small machine footprint. The cons of a moving beam style machine are that it's harder to make than a moving table style machine, I would imagine. And the bearings are subject to the highest leverage forces because the bearings are offset so far away from where the work forces are coming from. Okay, so moving bridge style now. Again, pros and cons. One of the significant ones is that the bearings are subject to a much lower um, like lever ratio because the bearings are down at the same height as the workpiece. The machine base can also be much simpler, basically just a big flat sort of you know, rectangular shape that can support the gantry. And again, being a moving gantry machine, the machine design is weight independent of the workpiece. Also, again, one of the pros of having the moving bridge style is that you can fit a lot of workspace inside a small machine. One disadvantage is that that whole gantry system will be quite heavy because you have to move the columns and the gantry and everything else attached, the z-axis. Lastly, moving table design. So again, pros and cons. One of the easiest to manufacture because you just need to move a table back and forth and uh, it, there's less difficulty as far as lever action on any of the bearings. Also, you only need one ball screw for each axis. You don't need to move the gantry back and forth. But one of the big disadvantages of a moving table design is that you're moving the table, which means you're moving the workpiece. So if you're working with varying ranges of, of weight of, of workpiece, which you probably definitely will with a machine like this, 
your machine depends on the weight of that workpiece. You're moving heavy weights back and forth, which if you're using servos, maybe that affects your tuning. However, one of the positives is that I think this would be one of the easier machines to make rigid because you don't need to make a moving gantry and it's easy to make a table gantry because it's a large flat area. You can space the bearings out nicely and you only need one ball screw for that table as well. And another thing that may affect you depending on the size of your shop, the machine for the same size envelope has to be bigger because you're moving that table around and that has to take up more space. Next up, this was just a, a fault of my design. I was working with a tight budget and so I was trying to squeeze as much envelope as possible out of a certain length of, you know, ball screw and a linear guide and, um, and size of a frame. So I ended up making the, the bearings on the gantry, the, like the bearings that support the whole gantry, they're too close together and that ends up with a, you know, a lot of, I keep saying this, the lever action on these bearings. They should have been spaced maybe 50% further apart just so they have, I, I generally go for a rule, I don't know where I learned this or read this, but four to one. So if the bearings are 200 millimeters apart, the maximum that like a tool should be working from is um, four times 200, which is 800 millimeters away. Any more than that, and you're starting to go over this ratio of where the rigidity is just lacking. Or maybe another way to put it is just that you're putting too much uh, stress through those bearings. You want to give your bearings enough margin so that they can perform for you know a long time. If you're putting a lot of stress through your bearings, they're just gonna wear out quicker. Gantry orientation. So this was a fundamental flaw with the design of my machine. Um, I've actually seen quite a few, few people do it where they put the gantry spanning the longer distance of the machine. I think that's not a great idea. It does give you greater ease of access because you've got this wide opening to put work in and out, which is nicer to work with. But spanning that long distance means you need to make a pretty rigid gantry. Whereas if you just turn the gantry to span the, the shorter side of the machine, the gantry doesn't have to be as long. So you can use the same materials to get a, a much more rigid gantry. And on top of that, being a smaller gantry, it'll be lighter and so it can accelerate faster. One other kind of stupid aspect of it was that I just like the look of it having a nice big gantry. Uh, there's something, something cool about big moving gantries. Um, you know, when you go to a steel, for a steel merchant and they have the big cranes and stuff like that. I like it. It shouldn't affect your decisions about how to engineer a machine, really. But it did because I was 19. So if I was gonna make the machine again, I, I would actually rotate the gantry 90 degrees. I'd make it shorter and maybe I could make it the same shape and everything just shorter and that would make it much more rigid. LM guide choice, linear motion guides. Another budget inspired mistake. I was 19, I didn't have that much money and I was trying to build a five axis router. So I cheaped out on the motion guides. I bought those round ones off of eBay and I kind of didn't expect a lot out of them, but I thought maybe I could get away with it. No, they suck. <laughs> if you're building any serious machine, just get, get the proper ones, you know, the square shape with the profile ground into them. They're much more rigid. They're not as forgiving as far as alignment, but if you're building a precision machine, then you should be building with precision in the first place, right? So they were a poor choice. Even if I spaced them apart more appropriately, um, even if I got larger ones, they just are not the right choice for a nice precise machine. Now I did end up upgrading the Z-axis ones to some nice, um, quite high load, I think they were 25 millimeter um, linear motion guides. And they were excellent. They, de they definitely felt like they improved it, but they also just exposed that the problem wasn't actually in the Z-axis, it was in the gantry flexing. I was thinking maybe the Z-axis was the, one, the problem, but yeah, the gantry, the gantry's the problem. The CNC controller. So I used Mark IV with an uh, Warp 9 Ethernet Smooth Stepper. I didn't have a great experience with this. First of all, Mark IV is not a great choice if you're building a five axis machine because it doesn't have the inverse kinematics to handle tool center point rotation where as the tool rotates, you need to be able to offset the linear axes um, to keep the tool, the tool point or the tool um, end on the programmed path. 
That's all explained in my previous video. Uh, I'll link it in the, in the description. There's probably a card right here too. Whoa. And uh, also working with, you know, Mark 4 and the Ethernet Smooth Stepper, I just got a lot of bugs while I was working on it. When I used the inverse time feed rate, it kind of just forgot the path that it was supposed to be taking. It just went off in a random direction and it w ruined the workpiece. So my experience running a five axis DIY machine with Mark IV and Ethernet Smooth Stepper was not fantastic. For my next project with my five axis mill that I'm working on, I'm gonna be using Dynamotion Kflop. Um, another option might be Linux CNC. That's a pretty popular option for DIY five axis machines. I like the look of Dynamotion. So you'll be seeing me working on that, getting it going and and hopefully I can make a lot of educational video on that as I learn it myself. So again, if you're interested in learning about the inverse kinematics of a five axis machine uh, and how I went about it, go watch that other video. Again, link, link in the description. Now, trust me, I still am working on the mill project, the five axis mill. Uh, I'm scraping it in the Gold Coast. I'm studying at the same time. I'm pretty busy right now, but I'm trying to get it done. So please bear with me. I hope some of this information was helpful to someone who's building their own machine or trying to design their own machine. Uh, it's fun. It's fun designing and building these machines. So uh, just trying to pass on my experience and um, hopefully that'll help you build the best machine you can. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up <laughs> and um, I'll see you next time.